The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Kaijin's webinar. It's a great honor to have you all with us today. My name is Kel Kirschbaum, and I will be the host of today's webinar. Before we get started, I would like to make you aware that all lines are muted, but you can contact us and raise questions in the question box on the upper right corner of your screen. Uh, I would like to ask you now to um, to check if you can all see the screen and of course also if you can hear me clearly then please enter a yes in the question box now. Perfect. I can already see some some yes replies so thank you for that. Um, so please type in your questions during the webinar and we will be happy to collect them for a Q&A session towards the end of the webinar. Our today's webinar is focusing on automated nucleic assets purification from diverse sample types using dedicated microbiome kits on the Kaya Cube. Before we start with the presentation, I would like to introduce our today's speaker, Dr. Patrick Smith, to you all. Patrick um, obtained his PhD in immunology at Tufts Medical School in Boston. And before joining Kaijin in 2016, he worked as a postdoc at the Harvard School of Public Health and the Max Planck Institute for the Biology of Aging in Cologne, where his work focused on the microbiome. In his current role as an R&D scientist heading the Sample Technologies Microbiome Group, group at Kaijin, he and his team are responsible for new product developments. Today, Patrick will share his knowledge and expertise in automated nucleic acid isolation from microbiome samples. So a warm welcome from my side to you, Patrick, and thank you for, for joining us today. It's my pleasure to hand it over to you now. All right, great. Thanks, Kel, and thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, I hope you enjoy, enjoy the webinar, and please, as Kel said, type any questions you have uh, in the box on your screen, and we'll be happy to answer them at the end. So today I'm going to talk about the automated nucleic acid purification from different sample types using microbiome kits on the Kaya Cube. A legal disclaimer that we can skip over. And the webinar will consist of four parts. Um, an introduction will briefly introduce the microbiome as well as our inhibitor removal technology. I'll talk briefly also about the Kaya Cube and how, that, and how it works as well as um, semi-automated nucleic acid purification using both DNA and RNA kits on the Kaya Cube. And finally, a uh, sample to insight workflow um, that we performed, which, uh, which is possible in highlights using the Kayam Power Fecal Kit on the Kai Cube, as well as some of our library preparation kits for next generation sequencing and bioinformatics with the CLC microbial genomics workbench. So to begin, um, the microbiome definition and background. The microbiome is defined as collective genomes of microbes and mostly thought of as bacteria, but not just bacteria. This also includes phage, fungi, protozoa, and viruses uh, that live inside and on the human body. Um, in this case, not just the human body, but also uh, in the environment as well. Um, the microbiota refers to a collection of the microbial organisms and metagenomics is the study of their collective genomes. Um, one of the earliest projects uh, to work on this was, and, and largest was the Human Microbiome Project, where they went about cataloging uh, on all the different organisms that live on humans, and in particular in healthy humans. Uh, and what they found was that over 10,000 organisms live with us, so on us and within us, um, with the large majority of these living within our intestinal tract, uh, where the microbial genes that are present in the intestine outnumber our own genes by greater than uh, 50, 150 to 1. And what they also found when looking at the microbiota in healthy individuals was that different body sites have unique communities, so not just within the intestine, but also on different parts of the skin, the oral microbiome. Um, they were all different and that these could be affected by um, things like race, age, gender, weight, uh, and ethnicity. Uh, another project is the Earth Microbiome Project, which was a multidisciplinary effort whose aim was to process over 200,000 samples from different um, biomes throughout the world. So diverse environments ranging from desert to volcanic microbiomes and volcanic soil to underneath the ice layers in the Arctic. 
um, and they wanted to generate a database of microbes and their gene products to enhance our understanding of the roles that microbes play in ecology. Um, just to give you an idea, it's estimated that one milliliter of ocean water contains over 160 distinct types of bacteria, uh, and one gram of soil contains a huge number of different, different bacteria. Um, and these are just estimates that for bacteria, they don't even include viruses, archaea, or fungi that are also present uh, in these samples. And so the point is that there's a huge uh, amount of diversity, both not just in, the, in humans, but also within the environment. And what do these things have in common was that they both used products from uh, mobile laboratories, which was located in Southern California and acquired by Kyogen in November of 2015. Uh, mobile was a world leader in um, DNA and RNA isolation tools for microbiome analysis. It is now, all of its products are now fully integrated with Kyogen. And we have uh, nine kits um, with a total of 20 different protocols that are available on the Kyocube as of today and custom protocols are also available upon request. Just to give you a further idea of some of the projects that these kits have been used with is that we talked about the Human Microbiome Project and the Earth Microbiome Project, uh, but also Metasub, which is the microbiome of the built environment, uh, um, American Gut Project, Teddy, which is environmental determinants of diabetes in the young, uh, and the Human Food Project, just to name a few. So most microbial, um, projects or microbial community analyses begin with a microbiome sample in which you can then extract DNA, RNA, uh, proteins or small molecules, and then proceed with typically either 16S or total shotgun sequencing um, or RNA-seq. And these can tell you different things. 16S sequencing can tell you, for example, what bacteria uh, and archaea are present and what their relative abundances are whereas total shotgun uh, DNA or whole genome sequencing can tell you not just which bacteria are present, but also fungi, yeast, um, viruses, and, and more quantitative amounts about their abundance, as well as their gene content. Um, and when thinking about your, your microbial analyses, really this starts with sample preparation. And there are several areas where sample prep inefficiencies can influence uh, the outcome of your microbiome or metagenomic study. Uh, and these include uh, insufficient cell lysis, which can lead to bias downstream analyses. Um, re reproducible isolation of high quality nucleic acids can also be difficult and influence your results. Um, but in particular today, I would like to focus on the co-purification of small molecule inhibitors, uh, particular of amplification reactions like 16S PCR. Uh, and these can cause a major problem by decreasing your amplification uh, efficiency or inhibiting library prep uh, reactions. So at Mobile and Kyogen, we focused on, on uh, isolating the microbiomes from a number of different sample types. Um, and these can be defined as their amount of inhibitors, either ranging from low to high or the, and their difficulty to lice uh, from easy to difficult. Um, as an example, blood and animal tissue typically have a low amount of inhibitors and are relatively uh, easier to lice. What we like to focus on are the samples that have um, high amounts of inhibitors and are also extremely difficult to lice. And these include things like um, plant and leaf tissue, stool and gut microbes, soil microbes, uh, and biofilm. And so most of our kits in this field are dedicated to, to isolating DNA that is usable for next generation sequencing PCR, qPCR analyses from these difficult sample types. Um, to talk further about these PCR inhibitors, so basically in the process of breaking open cells to release your nucleic acids, you also release these amplification inhibitors. And you can often see this when you're working with environmental samples, when after lysis you have um, brown or green or other colored um, eluent after lysis. And these inhibitors include things like humic and fulvic acids in soil, uh, polysaccharides and polyphenolics in plants, and bio, bilirubin, and heme uh, in stool, just to name a few. And why is this important? Well, if you look at um, just simple your DNA that you get following procedure with and without IRT, uh, if we look at nanograms per microliter, this is just looking by nanodrop, you can see that you have a much higher uh, concentration um, without IRT than with, but the, and this can be misleading because if you look at your 260 to 30 ratios, you can see these are much lower and worse uh, in the absence of IRT, and you also have a higher absorbance at A340, uh, which can lead to 
which can be indicative of the presence of inhibitors. And if you look further at nanodrop curves or a gel, you can see that in the absence of IRT, um, these samples look much less clean. However, to, to make this more clear, uh, you can look at this by qPCR and, and to really see where IRT can make a difference from difficult samples. And this was from a difficult uh, soil sample that we're showing here to isolate. Um, and we had two samples that were isolated with IRT and two samples without. Um, and if you look at the gel or if you just look at your 26280, 26230 ratios, it might not be obvious uh, about the presence of inhibitors. Uh, sure, without IRT, the 26280 and 26230 ratios are a little bit lower, but they're not terrible. However, if we look at um, the qPCR results, so this is just basic 16S uh, qPCR primers looking at total bacteria, what we can see is that if we look at the samples with and without IRT, and just focus on those for a minute, you see the samples that had IRT, uh, that were processed with IRT, have a higher CT value and are more consistent. So they come up at right about the same uh, CT value. And if you look at those that were processed without IRT, you see not only is the CT value much lower, uh, but less, less consistent. And in, even in the case of one of the samples, does not is more or less a negative value. And so this really can show um, the power of IRT in that it not only helps get you full amplification, so if you're quantifying something by qPCR, but make sure you're amplifying your entire community with 16S PCR, um, so you, it can really help remove inhibitors to make sure you're getting accurate analysis of your microbial communities. Um, but not just for PCR, low levels of, of inhibitors can also inhibit enzymatic reactions commonly found in whole genome sequencing library prep kits. Okay, so moving on to the Kaya Cube. Uh, the Kaya Cube, if you're not familiar, is a fully automated system um, for isolation of DNA. And in a workflow, it typically falls in the middle. So we have we have technology available for sample collection uh, and disruption, followed by purification, cDNA synthesis or library prep for next generation sequencing, and analysis. Um, with things like the rotor gene PCR system, CHI-XL, or um, in the case of bioinformatics, we have this TLC genomics workbench or this TLC biomedical workbench. The chi cube falls right in the middle for the isolation of DNA and RNA. Um, more specifically, it's a low throughput, so 12 samples per run. We have kits for DNA, RNA, and protein purification. And importantly, there's no change from the manual spin column procedure, so you don't have to worry about any optimization or at least limited from your manual. It's benchtop plug and play, so you can just use the kits that you buy for the manual procedure, and they have most things in terms of buffers that you need uh, to run on the Kaya Cube, and you eliminate these manual processing steps, freeing you up for uh, to perform other tasks. The standardized protocols ensure control and reproducibility, and we have over 120 uh, protocols currently available on the Kaya Cube, as well as customized protocols, as I mentioned previously, available. And just to give you an idea of how the Kaya Cube works, uh, if you're not familiar with it, um, typically it's a standard procedure where you have a rotor adapter shown here on the left. This is kind of one of the key things of the Kaya Cube that fits in the centrifuge. It has um, positions for both elution tubes and spin columns, among other things. Um, and if you look at the pictures here going across the top, you have a sample loading rack as shown here. Um, this is where for most protocols, um, you will load your samples into this. However, some of the microbiome protocols, you will also load your sample directly into the rotor adapter. And this can be shown, this will be shown and in, and instructed on the protocol sheet with your given protocol. Um, next to the sample loading rack, we also have where we load the buffers in their, in their Nalgene bottles that come with the Kai Cube or the Kai Cube accessory kit. Um, and it holds up to six different buffers. Then you would load your buffers in there as well as tubes in your sample loading rack and the rotor adapters into the centrifuge. And then once that's done, the Kai Cube will perform an automated check based on your protocol. So making sure that you have the correct number of samples loaded in the shaker, verifying that this matches to the number of samples in the centrifuge in the rotor adapters. It will then go on to check to make sure that you have sufficient buffer volume to complete your protocol based on the number of samples and also the number of tips uh, necessary to complete the protocol. Um, finally, it checks to make sure that once it takes up a tip that the tip is appropriately 
fixed onto the pipetting arm of the Kaya cube, making sure um, that your pipetting will be accurate. And so this is all to say basically that the Kaya cube performs a number of checks to make sure that once you hit start, it will finish the protocol uh, as expected. And this is just an overview of the number of kits that we have available for different things from genomic DNA from human samples or forensics, viral DNA, RNA, plant and food samples. Um, and as this webinar will focus on in a minute, um, a number of microbiome based kits. Which brings us to our third part, which is the semi-automated nucleic acid isolation using DNA and RNA dedicated microbiome kits. So typically these follow a, a standard protocol, an all-in-one protocol for sample preparation and the removal of inhibitors. This begins with collection, um, followed by microbial cell lysis. This is usually done mechanically. Um, this is followed then by the removal of inhibitors and patented inhibitor removal technology, and then um, the isolation of microbial DNA. This includes binding, washing, and eluding of your DNA in a spin column based uh, procedure. As I said, this is an all in one, these are all in one protocols, and they are designed for sample materials inherently rich inhibitors, including mammalian stool, um, human, mouse, cow, and horse, among others that we've tested. Uh, also bird stool and environmental samples like water, soil, biofilm, and plants. And importantly, the DNA is ready for immediate use in downstream applications like whole genome sequencing, 16S PCR, uh, qPCR, or PCR genotyping. So there's no additional cleanup necessary for the large majority of sample types. Um, sample collection and microbial cell lysis is performed manually. However, the, the Kaya cube performs both inhibitor removal and bind wash eluding steps uh, for you. So this means that in about 45 minutes, depending on the protocol, you have uh, hands-free high-quality DNA. So specifically to start, I'd like to focus on some of our kits for the isolation of soil. Um, soil contains distinct and diverse microbial species. Um, also, depending on the environment, whether it's temperate, desert, compost, Arctic regions, um, the composition and quality of the bacteria present can be very different. Um, soil biodiversity is influenced by things like pH, chemical composition, uh, and organic matter within the soil environment. Um, and this can make the isolation of nucleic acids particularly difficult, as well as the presence of a large amount of humic acids, which are, are major PCR inhibitors. Uh, and for this, we recommend uh, the DNEasy Power Soil Kit as our, as our most well-known kit for isolating DNA from environmental samples. Uh, and just to give you some background on this kit, um, it's able to isolate high um, yield of intact genomic DNA from a number of different uh, sample types. And so if you look at the top, this gel picture here across the top, you can see that we were able to isolate DNA from, from landfill, from different composts, from marine sediment and lake sediment, from horse manure, topsoil, um, and mud sediment, just to name a few. And we compared these with two other suppliers, and you can see that supplier A did not fare quite so well, uh, whereas supplier B was also able to isolate um, a high quality, a large amount of a high yield of DNA from each of these sample types. However, when we then performed uh, 16S PCR, um, on one microliter of undiluted DNA um, from these samples, we saw that only using the DNA Easy Power Soil Kit, uh, we were able to isolate the DNA from each and every sample. Um, even supplier B, which had isolated a large amount of DNA, it was not able to remove all of the inhibitors, and therefore we only had ampl PCR amplification from a few different sample types. So moving forward to showing how this kit compares, it works on the Kaya Cube. We then performed, uh, when we put kits on the Kaya Cube, we perform a standard procedure comparing the Kaya Cube protocol to the manual protocol, making sure that things like yield and quality uh, are the same. And so for the DNEasy Power Soil Kit, we used uh, 250 milligrams of estuary or compost soil, uh, and then compared things like yield and quality. And what we saw was that there was no difference in DNA yield, as shown here, for both sample types. Um, and you can see that as measured by a fluorescence-based assay or looking at this, these gels, uh, agarose gels down in the bottom, you can see the DNA quality and intactness of the DNA is equal between both the manual and Kaya cube protocol. Um, and they both had equivalent and acceptable A260-280 to 60 ratios. Uh, importantly, we can measure PCR inhibition and we do this with the Kaijin Quantifast Pathogen IC DNA kit. 
And the way this works is that it has a positive control um, shown here on the right in gray, which amplifies at around 29, uh, CT value of 29. And you spike in then five to 10 microliters um, or as little as one of your DNA eluate into the reaction. Um, and if inhibitors are present in your sample, you will get a change in the CT value, typically um, between three and 15 being complete inhibition. Um, and so what we see when we compare the chi cube extraction in light blue with the manual and compared to the control, we see that the chi cube was able to um, universally remove all inhibitors from 12 different samples um, using the power soil power soil kit on the chi cube and we can see that it was even a little bit more um, accurate and consistent than the manual protocol and this is one of the major um, selling points of the chi cube is that it really um, helps with reproducibility um, moving on to a different type of sample input, water is another one, um, sample type that is often used for microbial research. Again, this has distinct and diverse microbial species and things like oceans, lakes, streams, marshes, and again, Arctic regions. Um, water can also contain a large amount of humic acids, but also heavy metals, other, ke other chemicals, and biological waste, which can inhibit your PCR. Um, and for this, we automated the DNEZ Power Water Kit on the Kaya Cube. And for some uh, examples of samples, we took samples from the Carlsbad Lagoon in California, as well as the Pacific Ocean. Um, these are good samples to use because the Carlsbad Lagoon has a large amount of uh, inhibitors present and the ocean is a little bit of a low um, biomass sample. And what we saw, again, was when we compared the Kaya Cube protocol in light blue to the manual protocol, we were able to get similar amounts of DNA uh, yield from both samples. And this was using 75 mils of lagoon water or 150 mils of ocean water uh, as input, which were then filtered um, onto a filter and then, and then bead beaded with the power water kit and, and then placed in the Kaya Cube as per the protocol's instructions. Um, we also saw no difference again in quality, looking at the 26280 and 26230 uh, ratios, they were equal between the manual um, kit and the Kaya Cube protocol. Again, looking at, at uh, agarose gel here on the top, we can see that the DNA isolated with both the manual kit as well as the Kaya Cube was um, intact and of a higher, higher molecular weight. And when we look at PCR, spiking it in this case five microliters of our DNA eluate from lagoon water, which is highly inhibitory. Um, we were able to see that both in the manual and Kaya Cube protocol, we completely removed all inhibitors indicating that uh, the DNA is ready for immediate use in, in downstream applications. And so these, these uh, data show that the Kaya Cube um, is able to use both the power water kit and the power soil kit equally as well um, as the manual version. Moving on, another common area of research is, is biofilms. This is less common than soil and water. However, these biofilms can be extremely difficult um, to lyse and also contain a large uh, amount of inhibitors such as extracellular DNA, proteins, and polysaccharides. And so for this, we automated the DNA Easy Power Biofilm Kit on the Kaya Cube. Uh, and similar with the other protocols, we compared uh, DNA yield quality and PCR uh, inhibition between the manual and the Kaya Cube protocol. And what we found again was no differences between the two. And so if we look at DNA yield here as measured by again, fluorescence based um, detection, we see uh, equal amounts of yield between the Kaya Cube protocol and the manual protocol. And again, similar um, intact DNA by agarose gel electrophoresis, as well as similar 26280 and 26230 uh, ratios. Again, looking at PCR inhibition as one of the highlights of these kits and our inhibitor removal technology, as I mentioned, biofilm in particular has uh, a lot of inhibitors in that. And for both the manual protocol and the Kaya Cube, we're able to um, completely remove uh, these inhibitors. Finally, I'd like to switch over to uh, RNA for, um, from DNA. And so RNA from human and animal stool, this can be difficult to lyse uh, without introducing biases. This stool can contain um, high amounts of inhibitors, as I've mentioned previously, and intact and high quality RNA can also be uh, difficult to obtain due to the presence of, of other of these inhibitors as well as degrading enzymes in stool. 
And for this, we automated um, the RNA Z Power Microbiome Kit on the Kai Cube. So looking at RNA yield here on the left, as well as 26280 and 26230 ratios, we saw that both the manual version and the Kai Cube version uh, produced a very high RNA yield from 200 milligrams of human stool as input, um, around 35 to 40 micrograms for each. And they both had 26280 and 26230 ratios uh, of around two, indicating high quality um, RNA isolated from using both the manual and the Kai-EQ protocol. Furthermore, when we looked at PCR inhibition, we saw that um, in most cases for the manual and in all cases for the kai -Cube protocol, we're able to uh, completely remove all inhibitors from the sample. And just to give you an idea of a comparison, um, we have a sample that we processed without IRT in here, and you can see that there were a large number of inhibitors present in this particular stool sample. And so in the absence of IRT, we had complete uh, PCR inhibition as shown here in red. So I was just showing you the avail availability and ability of the Kaya Cube to perform uh, these protocols um, for both DNA and RNA isolation for dedicated microbiome isolation equally as well, and in some cases better than the manual protocol. Um, and as kind of a proof of principle, I would also like to show you now uh, briefly assemble the Insight workflow that we developed using the Kaya Amp Power Fecal Kit uh, on the Kaya Cube which the DNA was then able to be used directly in downstream next generation sequencing library preparation and then bioinformatics uh, with the CLC microbial genomics workbench. So again, this started similar to the other protocols with sample collection. So we had 10 uh, human stool samples and we divided them into two groups. Um, for comparison, we had uh, young samples and age samples as shown here, we had a mix uh, of both males and females in each group. And for the age samples, they ranged from 65 to 78 years of age. And for the young samples, they ranged from 28 uh, to 49. Um, we collected additional information and additional metadata such as race and diet and antibiotic usage. And following isolation, um, with these samples were then used directly for 16S and whole genome sequencing, followed by analysis with the CLC Microbial Genomics uh, Pro Suite. And as with the other Kaya Cube kits, we performed microbial cell lysis manually using either uh, tissue lyser 2, power lyser, or vortex adapter, depending on your kit and difficulty to lyse of your samples. And then the Kaya Cube was able to perform uh, both inhibitor removal as well as bind washing and eluding of microbial DNA. And so using this, again, we used 200 milligrams of human stool as input. Um, these were lysed in power bead tubes for 10 minutes using a vortex adapter. Uh, and the supernatant was then placed directly in the Kaya cube for DNA isolation. Uh, and as you can see here, we isolated um, high quality DNA from all 10 samples. I'm um, showing it here in agarose gel on top, as well as DNA in terms of microgram yield uh, per sample, where each bar is an individual sample, um, as measured by a fluorescence-based uh, assay. You can see that there is some difference between the samples, and this is likely due to natural variation in microbial content in human stool uh, between individuals. So then after we had this high-quality DNA, we next wanted to perform um, 16S um, library prep and analysis. And if you're not familiar with this, um, the 16S um, gene in most is present in bacteria and it consists of alternating constant and variable regions. Uh, the variable regions are labeled V1 through V9. Um, and with the way 16S RDNA amplification works is you design primers against these constant regions and they use, and then they amplify a variable region, which can then be used for a microbial uh, identification. And the most often looked at variable regions are V1 through V3 and V4. Once you have your, your PCR amplification, you can perform amplification sequencing, the next generation sequencing, followed by uh, data analysis to determine community composition, as well as diversity within uh, and between your samples. And so we did this. And so immediately following DNA isolation, we performed uh, 16S PCR amplicons using the Kyogen Multiplex Master Mix. And we did this with 22 cycles. And what you can see on this agarose gel picture here is that for all 10 samples, for both young and old, we had um, 
sufficient amplification after just 22 cycles, indicating that um, the inhibitor removal allowed efficient DNA amplification, and this was specifically of the V4 region. So we did this performance using modified uh, earth microbiome primers. Another important um, point about this slide is that we also had two blank samples, and so these samples were water controls uh, that were actually placed in the Kaya cube with the other 10 samples, and so they were allowed to run through the whole uh, Kaya and power fecal protocol on the Kaya cube. The water was then isolated and processed for 16 SPCR alongside the young and old samples, and what you can see is that we did not amplify any bacterial DNA by 16 SPCR in these blank samples, indicating that uh, there was no cross-contamination either in our PCR or in the Kaya cube during the Kaya and power fecal protocol. So now that we had these 16 S um, Amplicon products, we then added um, adapters and barcodes using the Kaiseq one-step Amplicon kit. And we used 50 nan 500 nanograms of Amplicon as input. Uh, and all libraries had a final concentration of more than 10 nanomolars, which if you're familiar with sequencing, uh, you know that that is more than enough uh, to give to your sequencer or favorite library sequencing core um, to perform an NGS. And so the Kaiseq one-step Amplicon kit basically combines um, traditional library prep of end repair, a paling, and ligation into a single 30-minute um, step, so thereby making it much more efficient and quicker. And then this can be used, again, directly for sequencing. We also performed a whole genome sequencing library prep using the Kaiseq FX DNA library kit. Uh, this kit has advantages in that it accepts a wide range of DNA input, ranging from one nanogram to one microgram. Uh, it's easily customizable in terms of fragment sizes, so based on your amount of input DNA and fragmentation time, you can get fragment peaks anywhere from uh, 250 base pairs to, to over 500 base pairs, depending on what you want to do from your analysis. And then similar to the Kaiseq one-step Amplicon kit, you add adapter ligation in a single step, and this is dual indices, so on both the forward um, and reverse side for sequencing, the reads one and read two, um, and this is fully compatible with uh, Lumina sequencing. And just to give you guys an idea of our sequencing results, and so we, we after performing both of these library preps for 16S sequencing and whole genome sequencing, we did uh, two times 250 base pair um, V2 chemistry on the Illumina MySeq. For 16S, we generated over 22 million paired end reads um, with over 90% passing the quality filter of clusters passing the quality filter, and 85% of reads had a Q30 score of greater than 30. Um, of these reads, 88% were assigned to an index. Um, we also quantified our libraries using a quiet Kaiseq um, library quantification kit, uh, and this worked very well because um, out of our identified reads, nine of 10 samples were between uh, nine and 11% of the total reads, meaning we had a very even distribution of libraries in our sequencing run, um, which if you're familiar with sequencing, you know that that is not always the case. Um, for our whole genome sequencing, we also did two times 250 base pairs on Illumina MySeq. Uh, we generated over 27 million paired end reads uh, with 97% passing the quality filter and 88% having a Q30, uh, greater than Q30 quality score. Um, and we had a similarly even um, distribution of reads between our samples. So basically our DNA isolation and library prep uh, and sequencing worked very well. So next we moved on, we have all these uh, sequences that we generated, we next wanted to perform microbial uh, analyses of who's there and what our community composition is and, and alpha and beta diversity analyses, and we can do this using the Kyogen Microbial Genomics Pro Suite. Uh, this is part of the Microbial Genomics Workbench, um, and it is basically integrated um, of all analytics for microbial genomics and metagenomics analyses. It's fully scalable with both data and sample metadata management included, so ranging from just a few to hundreds of samples. And it has streamlined workflows, uh, which allows users to focus on interpretation of results instead of trying to figure out how to actually use the software. Um, it's high performance algorithms are designed to save time and compute resources, so most things can be run on a standard laptop or desktop computer. Uh, however, it's also accessible to bioinformatics experts if, if you are interested, as well as non-bioinformaticians uh, alike. 
looking at it more specifically, the Microbial Genomics Pro, Pro Suite expands upon the CLC Genomics Workbench. And you do this by installing a series uh, of plugins and modules to add um, specialization. And these include um, the CLC Microbial Genomics uh, plugin, the CLC Genome Finishing, as well as Metagene um, Mark. And some of these can be used for both 16S and whole genome sequencing analysis. Uh, but not just this, you can also use this for agricultural biology or in food safety, or um, it has easily to use workflows for microbial typing and outbreak analyses. Um, so you can basically use it for pathogen identification. Uh, it's very easy to use. You just upload your data, and with these customized workflows, you can have your results in just uh, a few clicks away. It comes with an easy to use graphical user interface and has quick and helpful uh, customer service. To give more specifically into our workflows that we performed for both 16S and, and whole genome sequencing, um, we performed data import and quality control. And so this included uploading our data as well as trimming and filtering our reads based on quality score and then um, merging our paired end reads. Um, you can add databases for your analyses, so for 16S, things like Green Genes and Silva or RDP. You can also create your own. Uh, databases if you wish. Uh, and for whole genome sequencing, you can have gene ontology as well as protein family uh, databases. For the 16S workflow, um, this is followed by OTU clustering. Uh, it can perform both open and closed OTU picking. Um, or you can filter and modify your OTU table at this, and also build phylogenetic trees. Um, these then you can then use to perform alpha and beta diversity analyses. Uh, including phylogenetic diversity, unifract distances, as well as statistical analyses. For the uh, whole genome sequencing workflow, um, once you've uploaded and quality controlled your data, you can then perform a uh, de novo assembly of your reads. You can identify genes and coding sequences and then use uh, your database that you've uploaded to annotate these coding sequences. And from this, you can then build functional profiles using Go, perform statistical analyses, and in all cases, visualize uh, your data. So just moving now more specifically into the data, we performed this with our with our reads that we identified from our human samples. And this is just looking at a 16S uh, OTU and taxonomic assignment workflow, which includes quality picking, uh, quality filtering. And for OTU picking, we map sequences against the Green Genes beta database at 97% identity. Unmapped sequences were then clustered de novo. So this was similar to uh, um, open reference um, OTU picking. The results shown here are summarized at the genus level and where each column represents an individual sample with the five old samples uh, on the left and the five young samples on the right. And you can see that we were able to uh, identify a number of different genera present uh, in each of these samples as well as some differences between the two. I'd like to point out that um, the outputs are highly customizable, so you can change uh, labels on the graphs, so both X and Y axes, as well as uh, all of the colors and a number of other features are included. Um, not shown here, but you can also perform differential abundance analyses. And so if you're interested in what specific bacterial um, families or genera, or in the case of whole genome sequencing, species are different between your groups, um, the Microbial Genomics Pro Suite can also perform this type of analysis. Uh, moving forward, we also um, included the Microbial Genomics Pro Suite has an alpha and beta diversity workflow, and I'm just showing some results of this here. And so on the left is of your screen is um, number of OTUs, so basically the number of bacterial um, units identified and shown uh, as alpha diversity. And what we see here is that the young individuals have a higher alpha diversity compared with old as measured by the number of OTUs present. You can see this with the young uh, in pink and the old in red here. Um, other metrics are also available, including Shannon and Simpson diversity, as well as phylogenetic diversity. Um, for beta diversity analysis, we wanted to compare how similar or dissimilar our two groups are, in this case, young and old. And for this, I'm just showing an unweighted unifrac analysis. And what you can see here is the old samples in blue um, clustered separately from the young samples in pink, and this indicating that the two groups, uh, the microbial communities of the two groups are different. 
Uh, and this was actually significant as performed by a Pormanova analysis and corrected from multiple comparisons. Um, interestingly enough, as you look at this, you can see that we've been able to put the age of the samples next to it. Sorry, my computer just jumped around. I don't know if you're still seeing the, the right screen here, but I will get back on track in one second. There we go. Um, and as, as I was saying, you can see that, um, for example, when we put the ages next to them, we can look easily enough and see that the young sample that actually clustered more closely to the, uh, to the older samples was significantly older than the young samples by almost twice as much, so 49 years of age versus 28. And so perhaps this microbiome was, was already a little bit older than, uh, than anticipated. Um, and in all cases, the uh, outputs are highly customizable. Switching over to the whole genome sequencing uh, workflow, just looking again at read mapping and taxonomic assignment, you can perform this uh, on your whole genome reads, and this also includes quality filtering and merging of paired end reads. Um, the taxonomic profiling is basically performed by de novo assembly of your reads and then mapping back against a reference database. Uh, in this case, we just downloaded the bacterial genomes from NCBI. Um, however, you can also generate your own database, and all of this is very easy to do with the different um, options available inside the Microbial Genomics Pro Suite. Um, and the output, as shown here again, is abundance, um, and again, is highly uh, customizable. CLC Genome, the Genomics Pro Suite can also perform alpha and beta diversity analyses on whole genome sequencing data. However, I'm not showing that here. I'm looking further, not just the taxonomic assignment, it can also perform functional assignments. Um, again, following de novo assembly, um, we clustered our samples um, based on Euclidean distances to look for similarity or differences between the groups. Um, and what you can see is based on their functional assignment, there wasn't a huge amount of difference between our young and old samples uh, shown here across the top. However, this is not surprising uh, given that this is a small number of human samples and the variability uh, is very high. Um, more importantly, however, if you do have two groups that are very separate or even more similar like this and you are interested in looking at what genes or bacteria are, are different uh, from a statistical significant standpoint between these two groups, you can perform a differential abundance analysis uh, as shown here. And this is just um, an output um, of looking at the different um, pathways that were identified by Go analyses. And you can see that we are, were able to identify um, a number of, of, of differences between both the young and old samples listed here on the left. And you can have also the log fold change as well as a p-value um, and different ways to correct um, for multiple comparisons. So with that, I would like to just summarize a little bit. And so we talked about how the Kaya Cube can isolate uh, DNA hands-free in approximately one hour. And we did this uh, using a number of different kits that are available on the Kaya Cube, although I did not show data from all of them today. These include the DNA Easy Power Soil Kit, as well as the Power Liza Power Soil and the Power Fecal Kit. Dean Easy Power Water, the Dean Easy Power Plant Pro, um, Dean Easy Power Clean Pro, Power Biofilm, Ultra Clean Microbial, as well as the RN Easy Power Microbiome Kit. Uh, for library prep, we use the KaiSeq One Step Amplicon Kit, as well as the KaiSeq FX DNA Library Kit for whole genome sequencing. Uh, and then we use the uh, Microbial Genomics Pro Suite as part of the CLC Genomics Workbench to perform both our 16S and whole genome sequencing uh, analyses. And for those interested, we will also be releasing two uh, new related kits in 2018. This includes the PowerSoil Pro Kit, uh, as well as an updated version of the DNEZ Plant and Power Plant Pro Kit, which will be available uh, in 2018. And so with that, I'd like to take any questions and thank you very much for listening. Yeah, thank you, Patrick. So thank you for the nice uh, overview and presentation. And um, I would like to, to go over some, some questions from the audience uh, now, um, starting with the first one. So the first question uh, was, uh, which kit to use for um, leaf tissue? Um, and I think, yeah, it can be on, for both ways, right? For DNA or RNA isolation. So what, what would you recommend? 
Yeah, so for 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 leaf tissue in particular, I would recommend recommend um, either the DNEZ Power Plant Pro DNA or RNA kit. DNA for DNA, RNA for RNA. Um, this works very good, particularly if your um, uh, plants are high in inhibitors like polysaccharides or or polyphenolics. I should mention, as I said at the very end, if the this is something you're interested in uh, moving forward. We are working on a new DNEZ plant kit, uh, which will also be available on the Kaya Cube. And so if you are interested in being a beta tester or interested in this kit in general, you should contact uh, your local Kyogen, uh sales representative or Kyogen technical services, and they can help uh, put you in touch uh, with the right people if this is something you're interested in. Great. Yeah, and then the next question is what size um, can you or can we expect um, for the DNA to be uh, when using power kits? So I think whether it's a power soul kit or any other power kit, um, and, and which letter uh, have you been using for that or, or which letter is um, inside this, these kits? Um, so these kits don't come, do not come with a ladder. Um, in R and D, we use a number of different standard ladders when when we run agarose gels. Um, however, depending on, um, it, it really depends on your sample, what bead tube you have. And so we have a number of different bead tubes, ranging from garnet to glass to metal, um, and and also whether or not you use the vortex adapter versus the powerizer. So if you use something with more power, you're obviously going to um, shear your DNA more than if you do it more gently. But any, generally with these kits, uh, the DNA ranges anywhere from about eight to uh, 20,000 KB, depending on which kit and which lysis method basically uh, you use. Thank you. Yeah, and I also hope that answered your question. Then um, I would like to move on. And um, so there's another question saying, um, can I also use um, the DNEZ power water kit for my frozen water samples? Uh, yes, you can. However, we do not recommend um, using frozen water directly with, the, with, the, with these kits because freezing and thawing, like with anything, can change the composition of your uh, microbial community. I mean, of course, this this would still work. You just have to be aware uh, of that freeze thawing. Any of your samples might cause changes. Um, what we recommend with the Power Water Kit is that you filter um, your water sample first onto pay, onto the filter and then uh, freeze that filter directly. Uh, and this will help eliminate a lot of the changes that can occur with uh, with freeze thawing because the bacteria and the DNA are already uh, filtered onto the filter paper. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then another question we received is what homogenization protocol should I use for soil samples in general? For soil samples in general. Um, and so, uh, as I mentioned, we have three main um, homogenization protocols. These include the Vortex Adapter, uh, the tissue lyzer 2 and the power lyzer um, for we recommend starting um, with either the um, vortex adapter or the tissue lyzer or power lyzer on a lower speed um, just to perform your lysis and make sure you don't overly lyse and shear your dna however if you have more granular or difficult to lyse samples uh, sandy soils uh, um, or, or sediment for example then we recommend using uh, the power lyzer or tissue lyzer at a bit higher of a speed. Um, and again, this really just depends on, on, on your sample type. Right. Okay, then um, I have another question, which is more about the cross-contamination. Um, and the question would be uh, when running DNA or RNA preps in sequence um, on, on the same the same Kaikube instrument, is, is there a risk of you know, running into cross-contamination? Um, as you as you maybe saw during the sample to inside portion of the workflow, um, we had no um, contamination between our samples of DNA. Uh, so when we performed, we put two water samples in the rotor adapters and processed them with the Cayenne Power Fico kit. Um, there was no contaminating DNA uh, in these samples, and so that would indicate that you would not have to worry about. Um, DNA and RNA 
uh, being contaminated between your runs from the protocol. However, you do have to be careful when you are setting up um, or removing your samples from the Kaya cube to make sure that nothing spills or that you remove all tips for in between protocols. And in particular, if you use uh, RNAs or DNAs on your Kaya cube, it's also, you must be very careful not to make sure that any of that is, is um, left laying around when you're, when you're either pipetting it in yourself or when you're when you're removing it. However, as for the protocol itself, there's typically, uh, we do not see any cross-contamination that is measurable. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then another question just came in. Do you recommend particular polymerases for DNA amplification for PCR or qPCR? And is there a product from Kyogen you would recommend using? <sighs> Um, yeah, I would. Uh, so Kyogen's has the Quantifast line, um, and these are a number of multi, uh, multiplex um, master mixes that are available um, for PCR, ranging from qPCR to 16S PCR um, that work very well uh, with a high fidelity um, and low amounts of contamination. Um, we are also work, always working on, on new products, in particular um, new polymerases and PCR. Uh, kits in particular for 16S. And so if this is something uh, you're interested in, you should be on the look at, look out for that as well uh, in the next few months. Right. Yeah, thank you for that question. And then uh, one final question, if there's no anything else coming from the audience side is, um, what type of samples should I use for um, when working with biofilm? So. Uh, so sure. So, um, for example, the um, sample that we used here today for for our demonstration was actually um, from concrete, uh, which was biofilm was present on concrete, actually growing underneath the highway. But biofilm can come from um, rocks in in a river or a stream, for example, or inside of your sink, um, or pretty much any place. Um, that you can find uh, dark and damp and, and microbes growing. Uh, the, bio, the biofilm kit also works very well on microbial mats, um, which was designed to help specifically for and which are particularly difficult to lice and, and isolate DNA from. Perfect. Yeah, thank you, Patrick, uh, once again for, for this nice presentation, um, which brings us uh, to the end of, of today's webinar. I, I would like to thank everyone for joining. And uh, of course, we're looking forward to see you all again for the upcoming session. I think the next uh, session related to microbiome will take place on November 9th. So uh, yeah, please uh, check it out if you're interested. And then uh, for the rest of you, yeah, we wish you all uh, a good rest of the day or a good start of the day, wherever you are. Take care and yeah, see you all soon. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.